In the dark shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast. We are the brave and the bold. So as far as the last Western philosophy episode we did um, about talking about free will and liberty, um, I've really been thinking about the, that episode all week, and I think I might need to revisit it. So I was reading this piece by this guy named Dr. or maybe Professor, I can't remember, Epstein. Not that Epstein, it's a different Epstein, but this guy... Um, has been writing about what social media is doing specifically to politics. So he's talking about, he's predicting that the Republicans have no chance for victory because of what social media and Google is going to do during the election. It's an interesting piece. I suggest you guys find it if you're interested in this stuff. And it ties into so much stuff that we talked about Um uh, about the the media and all that. It's, we used to talk about this shit all the time in the older episodes. But um, so what basically he's talking about is that they these tech companies already know about you. They know how you vote. They know what you're paying attention to. They know what you're reading. And they create this algorithm or this thing in the way the systems are set up is it's, it's called a, what do they call it? It's an ephemeral experience. So it's not even code. It's just the way things are like lined up. So, you know, they, uh, and you know, this is something we might want to think about because this might explain Biden's kind of like comeback, right? Um, you know, maybe they're using it on them before they use it on us. But this, the thing is, is like it, takes away all of your choices and just gives you what they want, what they want you to see. And I thought it was very poignant and timely because we were talking about the, is that, would that be free will? If you're being denied information, it's like basically the, the social media is like the, is like the labyrinth that you're trapped in and you only have one direction you can travel and that's the direction that um these companies are give are giving you the whole thing is wildly unethical because all of them every single fucking one of them were at least started with taxpayer uh money or uh, subsidies of, of some sort um anyhow i don't want to get too far off in, into this thing it, the um the one thing that he pointed out was the suge- the what's next suggestions in YouTube uh, are crazy. He's got these crazy stats about them. Anyhow, I was listening to that and I was reading this piece and I was thinking that this has so much to do with the nature of free will and determinism. So uh, I found something that I think might go along the same lines. So I thought that we'd take another run um, at this without redoing the same episode, right? So uh, here we go. The Abracast, a cult, history, conspiracy, and violence. Explicit content indicator. This means that I use adult language. I do not speak in a humorless public radio hushed monotone. I am excited and enthusiastic about the information that I present and the topics I discuss. You will hear ice rattle in my glass throughout the show. On the show, I joke about bodily functions, sex acts, religion, and politics. 
The topics may seem random or scattered through the back catalog. A list of show topics in chronological order is provided on the featured topic link at abercast.com. If any of these issues might trigger you, this might not be the podcast for you. And I wish you good luck finding a show more to your liking. It's that time again. The music is low. The party is over. The fire is dying down. And all the ordinary people passed out long ago. Now we are the only ones left. That's right, pull your lawn chair closer to the fire and pour another drink into your vessel of the art. This is John Towers, and you're listening to The Abracast. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, uh, we're going to do, this is going to be a Western philosophy episode. Um, but I want to let you guys know without letting the cat out of the bag, cause I don't even know how much anyone fucking even pays attention to this. I think we're going to be making some programming changes around here and I don't want to hear shit from anybody about it. We're still sticking to the same topics. We're kind of sticking to the same formats. And I think we're even going to be sticking to the three shows a week, which is fucking crazy. Show me another goddamn podcast that does that. <laughs> I mean, consistently. Fucking tell me, please. Show, show it to me. So on Monday, the way it currently works, on Sunday morning, our, what it, the regular episode drops, right? And then on Wednesday, we've been doing these, it started with Nietzsche and then it went to Epictetus and now we're just going through kind of like the history of Western philosophy on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we've been doing interview show. So that's going to be shuffled up a little bit. I'm not losing any of those. We're just, it's just going to look a little bit different. I think it's more dynamic and, you know, I feel like if. Like, unless you got like a million subscribers or something, bro, you know, that you found the the formula that works. But if you aren't there, if you haven't met your yardstick of success, the only thing constant in podcasting should be changing, right? The only constant thing is that there's nothing constant. It should be in flux until you find that thing that works, right? So I'm, hey, I'm here to tell you. That I feel, (laughs) personally, bro, I feel like I could have a lot more listeners. I could certainly have more supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. But uh, so that's one thing that we're doing is we're just going to do a little slight alteration here in the way the shows are, the programming notes are set, the program is set up. Um, Maybe I'll write about it on the blog there's a new blog, by the way. Uh, maybe I'll write about it a little bit in the the newsletter if you're that interested in it. So you're going to start seeing these changes. But this week is going to be just the same. Okay? Just the same this week. And then the changes might start next week. However, they get rolled out. Anyhow, um, yeah, hey, you know, uh, I just realized, I just realized that um, I don't really have like a call to action for just for you guys to share the show. Um, and I think like everyone has at least one other weirdo that they talk to that might enjoy the show. So maybe if you guys take a screenshot of you sharing the show to for, to someone, not even on your social media, I'm not trying to get you doxxed, bro, but, um, you know. Just like a screenshot of like a email or maybe like a text message with the link of the show or something. Maybe I'll send you something. I'll send you something good. Uh, a lot of new stuff on the website. There's the store section now with some teas. Uh, I got my first order of t-shirts and they fucking look awesome, dude. They fucking look so sweet. I was so worried that the artwork, because they're designed to be fucking like two and 2.75 by uh, I don't can't remember four point seven five inch tarot cards, so I had to blow them way up to get them on the the t shirts. But really, I am a master of my craft because you can't see any gaps in the coloring or nothing. Like it looks so good. Oh uh, man, they look fucking dynamite, bro, dynamite. So I'm very excited about the t shirts. I got another order on the way. 
and they're cheap. <laughs> I mean, not the, the quality isn't cheap, but you know, like you go to like some of the print on demand places and like you, the way you got to bump them up to like the price points, it makes them, you know, not worth it, but it's a T public store. So they, I mean, they, they really take care of you as far as the prices are concerned and check in constantly because it seems like they're always putting them on special and they'll tell you how long they're on special for. That's pretty cool. It's so cool. I totally changed my t-shirt <laughs> options. So there's two up there now and they're both, uh, two of the tarot cards that I'm working on. Um, I'm going to be. I gotta find time. That's my problem, man. I don't have any time to do anything. But I'm gonna be doing the logo, the sigil logo on one of the shirts, and then um, I'm hoping to have something fun for next for ne specific to one episode that we're doing next month. Um, God, it's gonna be great. I think. So what are we talking about this evening? Here, uh, join me in toasting my supporters on Patreon and Subscribe Star. Here's to you guys. Thank you very much. Without you, none of this could be possible. So this is going to be a theme this week. <laughs> um, the la the Paris Commune episode. I stayed. I tried to stay away from everybody's names because I can't speak French. So here we go. Here's another Frenchman that we're going to be talking about this evening. Jean Paul Sar Sartor Sartora. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's S A R T R E Satre. Maybe that's how I'm going to do it. John Paul Satre. Um, and we're going to be, it's, uh, the condemned to be free be uh, from, this is an excerpt called condemned to be free from, uh, this guy's magnum opus, uh, which is called being enough being and nothingness. So let's go. We're going to be determined to get into a little bit of determinism. You know what I'm saying? It is strange that philosophers have been able to argue endlessly about determinism and free will to cite examples in favor of one or the other thesis without ever attempting first to make explicit the structures contained in the very idea of action. We should observe first that action is on principle intentional. The careless smoker who has through ne negligence caused the explosion of the powder magazines has not acted because it wasn't intentional. On the other hand, the worker who has charged with dynamiting a quarry and who obeys the given order has acted when he has produced the expected explosion. He knew what he was doing, or if you prefer, he intentionally realized a con a conscience project conscience project it does not mean of course that one must foresee all the consequences of his act the emperor constantine when he established himself in byzantium did not foresee that he would create the center of greek culture and language the appearance of which would ultimately provoke a schism in the Christian church and which would contribute to the weakening of the Roman empire. Yet he performed an act just in so far as he realized his project of creating a new residence for emperors in the Orient, equating uh, the result with his intention is here sufficient for us to be able to speak of action but it is not the case we establish that uh, the action necessarily implies the uh, condition of recognition of a determinatum. This is an object, an objective lack. The intention, I was just going to say what he's talking about, he's talking about unintended consequences of one's actions. The intention of providing a rival for Rome can come to Constantine only through the, apprehens the apprehension of an objective lack. The, uh, Rome lacks a counterweight 
to this still profoundly pagan city ought to be opposed by a Christian city, which at the moment is missing, creating Constantinople is understood as an act only if the first concept of the new city has preceded the action itself, or at least of this conception, serves as an organizing theme for all later steps. But this conception cannot be the pure representation of the city as possible. It apprehends the city in its essential characteristic, which is to be desirable and not yet realized possible. Turn the page. <laughs> How did I get like 300 episodes in? <laughs> and never done a turn the page. Oh my God. So on Spotify, if you search the Abercast on Spotify, the first thing you'll find obviously is the podcast. But the second, there's a playlist and it has all the songs that I bring up during the episodes. And it's quite an eclectic collection of music. Uh, but now I have to make a note because I'm going to have to add Bob fucking Seeger to it. <laughs> I should dub in some of that sweet saxophone. Wow, 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 wow. Walked into a diner east of Omaha. All right, I'm not going to subject you to much more of that. Back to it. This means that from the moment of the first conception of the act, consciousness has been able to withdraw itself from the full world of which consciousness and to leave the level of being in order to frankly to approach that of non-being consciousness is so uh in so far as it is considered exclusively in its being is perpetually referred from being to being it cannot find in any being any motive for revealing non-being two important con a consequences result one no factual state whatever it may be the political and economic structure of a society the psychological state etc is capable by itself of motivating any act whatsoever for an act is a projection of the uh for itself forward what is not and what is can in no way uh, determine by itself what is not. Okay. Uh, number two, no factual state can determine consciousness to apprehend it as a, oh boy, French, negativity, negativity. It just means as a lack. Thus, at the on outset, we can see what is lacking in those tedious discussions between determinism and the proponents of free will. The latter are concerned to find cases of decision for which there exists no prior cause or deliberations concerning two opposed acts, which are equally possible and possess causes and motives. Um, of exactly the same weight to which the determinist may easily reply that there is no action without a cause and that the most insignificant gesture, the raising of a right hand rather than the left hand, etc., ref refers to causes and motives which confer its meaning upon it. Indeed, the case could not be otherwise since every action must be intentional. Wow. What would Crowley say about this? I think he would certainly say that every act must be intentional. And any act that isn't intentional mm, would be an error. It would be an un... Uh, any... Oh, uh, boy, hold on. Any action that isn't intentional... You just got to work harder at it, bro. He would say, cut your arm, make a note of it, and try harder next time. <laughs> Each action must, in fact, have an end. 
and the end in turn is referred to a cause. Um, the end of temporalization, temporalization of my future implies a cause or a motive. That is, it points towards my past and the present is the upsurge to the act. To speak of an act without a cause is to speak of an act which would lack in the intentional structure of every act. And the proponents of free will by searching for it on the level of the act, which is in process of being performed, can only end by rendering the act absurd. Hmm. But the determinists, in turn, are weighing the scale by stopping their investigation with the mere designation of the cause and the motive. Well, I think... I mean, I'm not a genius and I'm certainly not a philosopher. If you haven't noticed, <laughs> I'm not that deep <laughs> most of the time, but it seems like if we're talking about a cause and we're talking about the reason for the cause or the motive of the cause, we're, how come we're not talking about the effect of the cause and any consequences of the cause? Maybe we will. Um, The essential question lies beyond the complex organization, cause, intention, act, end. Okay. Indeed, we ought to ask how a cause or motive can be constituted as such. Now, if there is no act without a cause, this is not in the sense that we can say that there is no phenomenon without a cause in order to be a cause the cause must be experienced as such see i don't know about that though because one can find a pattern and expect like how can you say that in a world where chess exists right it, you're cutting out anticipation of a pattern or anticipation of someone else's action. Yeah. Hold on, man. Of course, this does not mean that it has to be thematically conceived and made explicit as the case of deliberation. But at the very least, it means that the for itself must confer on its value to cause or motive. This constitution of the cause as such cannot refer to another real and positive uh, existence that is to a prior cause for otherwise it, uh, the very nature of the act as engaged intentionally in the non being would disappear. The motive is understood only by the end that is by the non existent. It is therefore in itself one of these negati negatites, negatites, the lack of something, the void. If I, ex oh boy, here we go. <laughs> a few years ago, someone got in real trouble for reading this word that I'm about to read, even though it doesn't mean any, it's not offensive in any way, but I'm going to dodge it, I think. <laughs> Oh my God, this is so stupid. All right. How am I going to deal with this? Okay. If I accept a low salary, it is doubtless because of fears and fear is a motive, but it is a fear of dying from starvation. That is the fear has meaning only outside itself. And in, uh, end ideally posited, which is the preservation of life, which I apprehend as in danger. And this fear is understood in turn only in relation to the value, which I implicitly give to this life that is, uh, referred to the hierarchical system of ideal objects, which are values. Thus the motive makes itself understood as what is met by a means of the ensemble of being which are not by ideal existences and by the future 
Just as the future turns back upon the present and the past in order to elucidate them, so it is the ensemble of my projects which turn back in order to confer upon the motive uh, its structure as a motive. Sorry for the on-the-fly editing, but <laughs> I get enough shit from people anyways already, so I needed to dodge that N-word. So, um, so all this fear talk the fear of your body dying all all this talk is really it's all i mean we're in like a we're living in an interesting time because i think that this coronavirus thing is totally out of control and i can say that because i'm an older chap nowadays and i've lived through y2k I've <laughs> lived through SARS. I've lived through the swine flu. I lived through mad cow disease. And you just see these things all the fucking time. I still can't give blood. I, I used to give blood all the time. I come from a line of blood donators. My old man gives blood all the time. I don't even know why. If, if I were to wake up from a fucking terrible car accident, they're like, hey, you got... Mr. Towers' blood, I would have been like, oh, can you just take it back? Please. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow um, yeah, so I lived in Europe at the time of a mad cow outbreak. And even to this day, if I try to, not that I even attempt anymore, but like 10 years ago or something, or, you know, I don't fuck, maybe even 20 years, I don't know. But they're like, you, sir, you are permanently deferred from giving blood. And I'm like, I'm deferred from it. Like, aren't you guys fucking emailing me every day to give blood? And I'm like, you got to take me off this fucking mailing list. Then. <laughs> um, so it turns out that mad cow disease can just spring up wherever. And I was in Europe at the time of a mad cow outbreak. So mad cow disease is when these fucking crazy farmers or the factory farmers or, or something, what they would do is after they would slaughter the cows and they would like rip out like the weird nerves and nervous systems and their bones and all this stuff. And they're like, well, what are we doing with all this shit? And like they're, it's so fucking unnatural and weird and cra like, why would you do this? They would grind all that stuff down, like all their like nerves and all their like tendons that they cut out or whatever. And they would mix it into the cornmeal and feed it to the fucking cow. They would, they're turning these cows into fucking like cannibals. And, uh, you know, you can't mess around with nature like that. Cause it'll, it's going to fucking have what unintended consequences. You made your fucking decision and now I can't give blood forever. Think of how many people I could have given blood to by now. Hi, I'm Lisa. I like coffee. Bonfires. Walks on the beach. Old books. But you know what I really like? The paranormal. Strange stories and experiences. Psychic phenomena. So, if you're interested... Join me at an open mind and a healthy dose of skepticism. And we'll see what happens. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com.
So I'm a happily married man, but um, Lisa's voice does it for me. <laughs> if you guys are looking for something to listen to after this, go check out the Immortal Hour podcast. It's like this. She does this weird. What is it? The ASMR or whatever. Um, all right, let's get back to this. We still have a little bit to get through. I feel like I'm being chatty this evening. The ultimate meaning of determinism is to establish within us the unbroken continuity of existence itself. The motive uh, conceived as a psychic fact. There, he's talking about like a. Like if you're reading like three squiggly lines on a card across the table from somebody, i.e. as a fool and given reality is the deterministic view articulated without any breaks with the decision and the act, both of which are equally conceived as psychic givens, the in itself, the in itself has got, uh, got hold of all these data. And motive provokes the act as a physical cause, its effect. Everything is real and everything is full, and thus the refusal of freedom can be conceived. Only as an attempt to apprehend oneself as being in its as being in itself. It amounts to the same thing. Human reality may be defined as a being such that it, it's being, <laughs> it's freedom is at stake because human reality perpetually tries to refuse to recognize its freedom. Psychologically, in each of us, this amounts to trying to take the cause and motives as things. We try to confer permanence upon them. An attempt to hide from ourselves what their nature and their weight depend each moment on the meaning which I give to them. We take them from uh, for constants. This amounts to considering the meaning which I give to them just now or yesterday, which is irredeemable because of uh, its past. And extrapolating from it a chapter fixed still in the present cause act and end constitute a continuum oh god damn it a continuum uh plenium the plenty of continuum <laughs> these abortive attempts to stifle freedom under the weight of being they collapse with the sudden upsurge of anguish before freedom show sufficiently that freedom and its foundation coincides with the nothingness which is at the heart of man human reality is free because it is not enough it is free because it is perpetually wrenched away from itself and because it has been separated by a nothingness from what it is and from what it will be. It is free finally because its present being is itself a nothingness in the form of the reflection reflecting man is free because he is not himself but presence to himself. The being which is what it is cannot be free. Freedom is precisely the nothingness which is made to be hmm. at the heart of a man in which forces human reality to make itself instead of to be. As we have seen for human reality to be is to choose oneself. Nothing comes to it, either from the outside or from within, that can receive or accept. Without any help whatsoever, it is entirely abandoned to the intolerable necessity of making itself be. Down to the slightest detail, thus freedom is not a being. It is the being of man, i.e., his nothingness of the being. If we start by conceiving man as a plen uh, plenum, 
It is absurd to try to find in him afterwards moments or psychic regions in which he would be free, as well as look for emptiness in the container which one has filled beforehand up to the brim. Man cannot be sometimes a slave and sometimes free. He is holy and forever free, or he's not free at all. Man being condemned to be free carries the weight of the whole world on his shoulders. Here, here. Free men do carry the whole world on their shoulders. He is responsible for the world and for himself as a way of being. We are taking the word responsibility in its ordinary sense as a consciousness of being. In const, uh, contestable, incontestable author of an event or of an object. In this sense, the responsibility of the for itself and overwhelming since he is the one by whom it happens that there is a world, since he is also the one who makes himself be, the one who makes himself be, I love it. Whatever may be, <laughs> whatever may be the situation in which he finds himself, the four itself must wholly assume this uh, situation. Turn the page with its uh, peculiar coefficient of adversity, even though it be un insupportable. He must assume the situation with the proud consciousness of being the author of it for the very worst disadvantages of the worst threats which can endanger my person have meaning only in and through my project and is on the ground of engagement which I am that they appear. It is therefore senseless to think of complaining, since nothing foreign has decided what we feel, what we live, or what we are. God damn it, that's so good. Fucking complaining. Motherfuckers complaining. For, <laughs> I'm sorry, a lot of this fits into something I'm working on, so I, <laughs> I need to take notes as I'm going through. Furthermore, this absolute responsibility is not resignation. It is simply the logical requirement of what? What is it? What is it a requirement of? The consequences of our freedom. What happens to me happens through me, and I can either affect myself with it or revolt against <laughs> it nor resign myself to it moreover therefore everything that happens to me is mine i take i take ownership of it ownership mm -hmm. uh, by this we must understand first of all that i'm always equal to what happens to me qua man or what happens to a man through other men and through himself can uh, be only human. The most terrible situations of war, the worst tortures, do not create a non-human state of things. There is, non there is no non-human situation. It is only through fear, flight, and recourse to uh, magical types of conduct that I shall decide on the non-human. Well, this decision is human, and I shall carry the entire responsibility for it. This comes up over and over. I'm always amazed at how often this idea of responsibility shows up Um when we're talking about the stuff that we talk about here on the show. And it also, it drives me nuts because, so we, we talk about philosophy on the show. We talk about the occult on the show. 
And we talk about, you know, magic and all this stuff. And these are all things that are ruled by the left. Yet every fucking nook and cranny you turn to, they're talking about responsibility. Wow. I think I said it when we were, when I was talking to Anthony Tyler, who's got a, who, his books out, by the way, go, go search it out. It's great. It's called the dive manual. Um, he's going to be back on the show. No time. But I remember talking to him and I said, you know, I look at this occult and the more and more I look at it, it's, it's, it's actually like a f- radical philosophy or it's a philosophy for radical self-responsibility. And he was just like, yeah, wow. <laughs> and so like every turn that I fucking run into this idea, uh, it drives me nut. It just fucking drives me crazy. I think I I might have lost my way here. Um, Back to it. But in addition to the situation is mine because of the image of my free choice of myself. And everything which it presents to me is mine. And that this represents me and symbolizes me. It is not I who decide the coefficient of adversity and the things and even their unpredictability by deciding myself. Thus, there are no accidents in life. A community event which suddenly bursts forth and involves me in it uh, does not come from the outside. If I am mobilized in a war, this war is my war. Again, he's talking about the, he's talking about taking responsibility for what's going on around him. Uh, maybe situational awareness and responsibility. It is in my image, and I deserve it. I deserve it first because I could always get out of it. Wow, this is a statement. Who knew this was going to get so crazy? Uh, I, I'm going to back up just a little bit. I deserve it first because I could always get out of it by suicide or by desertion. These ultimate possibilities are those which must always be present for us when there is a question of envisaging a situation. For lack of getting out of it, I have chosen to do it. This can be due to inertia. Or to cowardice in the face of public opinion, or because I prefer certain values other than the values, uh, um, the value to, oh boy, I f- f- messed it up. The value of the refusal to join the war, the good. Mm, opinion of any relatives, the honor of my family, etc. Anyway, if you look at it, it is a matter of choice. The choice will be repeated later on again and again without break until the end of this war. So we must agree with the statement in war, there are no innocent victims. If therefore I have preferred war to death or to dishonor, everything takes place as if I bore the entire responsibility for the war. Of course, others have declared it and one might be tempted perhaps to consider me a simple accomplice. This notion of complicity has only the judicial sense and it does not hold here for it depended on me. That for me and by me, this war should exist. And I have decided that it does exist. There was no compulsion here for the compulsion would have uh, got no hold on a freedom. I did not have any excuse for, as we have said repeatedly in this book, the um, people peculiar character of human reality is that it is without excuse. Therefore it remains to me to lay claim to this war. All right. He's continue. I have a lot to say, but he's continuing with this war thing. So I don't want to lose it. But in addition to war is mine because of the sole fact that it arises in a situation which I caused to be. 
And then I can discover it there only by engaging myself for or against it. I can no longer distinguish at present the choice which I make of myself from the choice which I make of the war. To live this war is to choose myself through it and choose it through my choice of myself. There can be no question of considering it as four years of vacation or a reprieve, a recess, the essential part of my responsibilities being elsewhere in my married family or my professional life. It is in this war I have chosen. I choose myself from day to day and I make it mine. In making myself, it is going to be four empty years and then it is I who bear responsibility for this. So this responsibility business, I think, is what's getting my dick hard about all this. Um, so here's, here's what I kind of opened the show talking about. So say that there are options that you are not aware of. In some... Uh, we'll just say a, some outside agency is causing you to not be aware of of the option or if not being aware of the option, maybe you're aware of it at some level, but it's jamming you up with say there's two options. There's option a and option B and you might like option a. So think of maybe I should reframe this. Okay. So there are two options. There's option B and there's option S. But the people who control the the media will just we'll say the proletariat the the propaganda, you know. So instead of showing you options B and options S, they sink options B. All you get are negative stories about option S. Going forward, all you get are negative stories about option S or all you get are zero coverage on option S and everything is pointed to option B. You get positive stories about option B. You get uh, heroic stories about uh, uh, option B. All the negative stories that are out there about option B, which is hilarious. The corruption of option B is off the charts, <laughs> but you don't hear any of that. You don't hear any of the bad stuff of option B. You just hear all the good stuff about option B. So this is where I'm thinking about free will and our responsibility for our own actions in here. Um, this Frenchman, who I'm not going to try to massacre his name again, is talking about a war. And he's like, I'm complicit in this war. I I chose by opting in on it and or not committing suicide when I got conscripted to to do to take part in this war. So it is mine. So looking at what we're talking about, about this Epstein, this Professor Epstein thing. And Google and YouTube and social media that we're talking about at the opening of the show, you know, where does our responsibility lie? Does it lie in finding, you know, the media was based on being a watchdog to the government. Now it seems like it's a Pavlog dog to the environment or to the, um, the government, the politics. Uh, it's a, it was supposed to be a watchdog for politics, and it turned into a Pavlov's dog of leftist politics. <laughs> I should learn to anticipate this rambling and try to get out of control. <laughs> this rambling now has become my responsibility, and I will face the consequences of it. In the in the iTunes reviews section, I'm sure. Hey, bro, I told you I talk about politics. So if you write a bad review about me talking about politics, you're the fucking asshole. 
because you're the one that waited 50 minutes to get offended. <laughs> All right, I really got to get through this. I'm falling apart. I'm getting blurry around the edges. Back to it. Finally, as we pointed out earlier, each person is an absolute choice of self from the standpoint of the world of knowledge and of techniques, which this choice both assumes and illumin illumines. Each person is an absolute upsurge at an absolute date and is perfectly unthinkable at another date. Wow. Boy, this is interesting, right? I I think what he's saying is that your position can change over time. God damn. Imagine that this cancel culture. Think about the cancel culture. These fucking purple haired fucking SJWs. <laughs> uh, or as Marilyn Manson called them in 1996, the anti people, the anti people they've gone too far. Now, is your anti-white and your anti-gay? What was um the anti-pope? The anti, I don't know, dope. <laughs> and now here is my anti-president gun. Fucking Marilyn Manson predicted cancel culture. He predicted where we are right now in our political environment in 1996. Go check it out. I'll put it on my fucking Spotify playlist. <laughs> Anti people, how come no one's mentioned that people? How come no one's used that? M M anti people. All right, like I said, I gotta get back to. I'm wandering. This will help. It is therefore a waste of time to ask what I should have uh, been if this war had not broken out. For I have chosen myself as one of the possible meanings of the epoch, which imperceptibly led to war. I am not distinct from this same epoch. I could not be transported to another epoch without contradiction. Thus I am. Thus I am this war, which restricts and limits and makes comprehensible the period which preceded it. In this sense, we may define more precisely the responsibility of the for itself. For to the earlier quoted statements, there are no innocent victims. We have the words, we have the war we deserve. Thus, totally free, indistinguishable from the period for which I have chosen to be the meaning as profoundly responsible for the war as if I had myself declared it, unable to live without integrating it into my personal situation, engaging myself in it wholly and stamping it with my seal, I must be without remorse or regrets as I am without excuse. For from the instant of my upsurge into being, I carry the weight of the world by myself alone, without anything or any person being able to lighten it. Yet this responsibility is of a very particular type. Someone will say, I did not ask to be born. We see this all the time nowadays, right? I saw a picture on FB the other day. <laughs> Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, of a dude holding up a sign at an abortion uh, pro-choice rally, pro-choice, this is hilarious, uh, holding up a sign at a pro-choice rally that says, the only happy baby is a dead baby. And I'm like, what the fuck is this all about? Anyhow, back to it. <laughs> this is a naive way of throwing greater emphasis on our fact facility. I am responsible for everything. In fact, except for my very responsibility for I am not the foundation of my being. Therefore, everything takes place as if I were compelled to be responsible. What a fucking worldview, man. I need to f do more reading on this dude. Oh, I couldn't pronounce his name. Sir Tree. 
I'm abandoned in the world, not the sense that I might remain abandoned and passive in a hostile universe like a board floating on the water, but rather in the sense that I find myself suddenly alone and without help engaged in a world for which I bear the whole responsibility without being able Whatever I do to tear myself from this responsibility for an instant, for I am responsible for my very desire of fleeing responsibilities, to make myself passive in the world, to refuse to act upon things and upon others, is still to choose myself. And suicide is one mode among others of being in the world. Yet I find an absolute responsibility for the fact that my toxicity here, the fact of my birth is directly inapprehensible and even inconceivable. For this fact of my birth never appears as a brute fact, but always across the projective reconstruction of my for itself. I am ashamed of being born, or I'm astonished at it, and I rejoice over it, for in attempting to get rid of my life, I affirm that I live and I assume this life as bad. Thus, in certain sense, I choose being born. And choice itself is integrally affected with a facicity, since I am not able to choose. But this facicity, I can't pronounce this word, so of course the universe keeps throwing it at me, in turn will appear only insofar as I surpass it towards my ends. This facicity, here it is again, it is everywhere and is incomprehensible. I never encounter anything except my responsibility. That is why I cannot ask why I was born or curse the day of my birth or declare that I did not ask to be born for these various attitudes towards my birth, i.e. towards the fact that I realize a presence in the world are absolutely nothing else but ways of assuming this birth in full responsibility and of making it mine. Here again, I encounter only myself and my projects so that finally my abandonment, i.e. my Facicity consists simply in the fact that I am condemned to be wholly responsible for myself. So, I mean, when we talk about these things, I bounce it. You know, I'm just going to hold off. If you're interested in my thoughts about this, uh, wait till the end. A after the after the wrap up. I'm going to go ahead and unleash a little bit. So this is the Abercast. I'm John. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for considering supporting the show. And uh, I'll see you in a few days. You know what I'm saying? A few days. I said a few days. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Tune in after this. To listen to me cut loose a little bit. Hey, did you learn something? Did you laugh? <clears throat> Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows as well as the exclusive fellow craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. 
you supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. (laughs) The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I'm proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition... Uh, to creating the show that you dig and that you are excited about. I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in on the quality and development of the podcast. And what if you can't afford, you know, $1 or $3 or $10 or whatever, a month. Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five-star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you could sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback, support, and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going. Oh, I'm, I'm back on. <laughs> so towards the end here of this um, thing that we were reading, oh, I got to find the thing, um, Condemned to be Free by Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, being in, from his... Mag, they call it the magna, magnum opus called Being in Nothingness. He, uh, I mean, he starts halfway through, he starts talking about this dog whistle that we have, right? Of this, uh, res- this responsibility that we here at the Abercast are always paying attention to because uh, it's so antithetical <laughs> of all the spaces that we um, uh, live in, right? That we operate in. You know, instead of being responsible, we look towards, you know, the government to provide. It's so silly. Anyhow, um, and then towards the end, he starts talking about, like, he he starts, he made this pass. I could always get out of it by suicide, he says. And um, he starts talking about the choice or the approval of being born, which is a... No- it could, I mean, it's a nihilistic concept, um, but uh, it's also, it, it's something that you might occur when you're talking to a Gnostic, which is, as you know, uh, sometimes what gets my, my Gnosticism gets my dick hard, right? So, um, so he's talking about, and it's, it's hilarious because he just, he points it out. <laughs> condemned to be free. You're born in this world to be free if you can make these hard decisions. But um, this uh, bit that I've kind of likened or whatever bumped up to against Gnosticism, it's talking about becoming a, a slave when he's, when, when he's born. He's pressed into this material uh, world. Um, one of my So a few years ago, not even a few years ago, shit, it was a long time ago, 2005, I put together a watercolor painting series. I don't even know if I have all of them anymore. I I mean, I don't have a lot of them sold. I don't even know if I have pictures of of them anymore. But um, at one point in time, I had like, I think it was 28 or 30 watercolors and they were all kind of not, a lot of them were kind of Gnostic hermetic um, alchemic themes to them. And this gallery gave me like 30 days to do, to do an, 
like I did an opening, like it was like a for real opening and everything. It was so cool, man. It was so great. But one of the the one of the biggest paintings that I had, this one did not sell. I actually have it. It's hanging up in my living room, so I can take a picture of that. That's what I'll do. But it's of an infink, as Popeye would say. It's of an infink, um, with like a shackle on its arm, and I feel like when I'm reading this guy's treaty. When I'm reading this guy's business, I'm ashamed of being born. I am astonished at it and I rejoice over it or I'm tempting to get rid of my life and affirm that I live and I assume this life as bad. Thus, in a certain sense, I chose being born. The choice itself is integrally affected with the facility since I am not able to to not to choose. I think it's interesting, right? This uh, idea of being in, enslaved the moment we're born. We talk about stuff like this a lot. You know, um, anyhow, I'm, <laughs> that's me. I'm John. Maybe I'll post that on, I'll post the painting. I'll post a picture of the painting on the, uh, Fulgar Correspondentia. So if you sign into the mailing list, you, you, you get a gander of this thing. Um, I'll chase down my wife's camera, my wife's phone. She's got a way better picture on her phone than I do on mine. And I'll, I'll try to do it justice. Um, but I'm John. This is the Abercast. And thank you guys for hanging out. Uh, bye. <laughs>